Okay, we're finishing the chapter. So, um, we're back to talking about polynomials over a uh, field coefficient, uh, uh, coefficient field. Um, and when we're over a field, uh, well, we know two things so far. So our goal is to say which ideals are prime and which are maximal uh, for now. So um, every ideal uh, in the polynomial ring over a field is principal, which means it's generated by only one element. And that means that it's a set of multiples of, of an element. So uh, you take x squared plus one, and then there's an ideal made of all the polynomials, which are multiples of x squared plus one. And, and conversely, any, any ideal is of this form. It's generated by whatever element there is there of the smallest degree, if you remember the proof. And the last thing we saw on Monday was that, well, we're trying to see which ideals are maximal. So it's important to know when they contain each other. Uh, so when do two principal ideals contain each other? Uh, the answer, just following the definitions, was that it's when the generator of the big ideal divides the generator of the small one, which it's kind of backwards. Um, so the, the thing in the bigger ideal divides the, the thing in the smaller ideal. This confuses me at least, but um, you have to think that, you know, you have that two divides six, more numbers are multiples of two than there are multiples of six. All the multiples of six are contained in the multiples of two. This is what is happening here. Uh, and that's, that's the review. So, um, so from here, um, I can, I, I, we can deduce some easy consequences. For example, when our two principal ideals the same, <clears throat> Uh, let's see, how can we, what does that mean in terms of the generators? So, all right, uh, what am I gonna write here? When do two polynomials generate the same ideal? Based on this. G divides F and F divides G, so okay. they're the same. So they're the same. Are they necessarily the same? They're almost the same. They could be uh, inverses, additive inverses. They could be inverses? So why oh. are they like, like negative? Um, that's so, okay. true. I guess that counts in. But that's not the only thing they could be. John, your microphone is on? They're multiples of each other, the Ooh. generators. Okay, John said that one divides, F divides C and G divides F. Um, but what, you know, how can that be? Um, you're almost, you're, you almost have the answer, but. So do they have the same generator and it's a multiple of G and F? Well, so they're both multiples of each other. Um, okay, let me. So the answer. So the answer is that they're they're constant multiples of each other. It's not that I get g by multiplying by some polynomial of any degree. The only way two polynomials can divide each other is if they're constant multiples. So they could be opposites. They could be the same, or one one could be seven times the other as long as seven is not zero in the field. Uh, okay, so let me just write that down. F is contained in G. And the ideal generated by G is contained in the ideal generated by F. 
so using this, this means that f divides g and g divides f. Um, and, and this means, well, if I write f equals g times h1 and g equals f times h2, um, if you look at the degrees, Great, so in conclusion, two polynomials generate the same ideal, even only if uh, they're multiples of each other. Uh, first, not, um, you can't multiply by zero. Then if f is zero times g, then g is not gonna be a multiple of f necessarily. Okay, so um, another easy thing to say, to see from here is that, uh, as you can see when a polynomial generates everything. So which, Uh, which polynomials generate the, the unit ideal? What is a polynomial that for sure generates the unit ideal? With uh, one as coefficient. Say that again. One. What about one? Just with with unit coefficients. How many coefficients? Uh, you mean like? Like this with one as, as coefficient? Oh, never. Oh, welcome. Would it be constant polynomials? It would be. Um, all right, uh, you get a bonus point. So, um, yeah, it is. So, the, so for any ring, the, the unit ideal, the whole ring is the ideal generated by one, uh, because that is in, in, a, in any ring, uh, every element is a multiple of one. And now, well, one is a polynomial. So by, by the previous part, this means that F is a constant multiple of one, which of course means that F is a constant, um, unless it's zero. So a polynomial generates everything if and only if, um, it's a constant, it's a non-zero constant. Wow. What is the 10, what, why is there three people one day and then six the next? All right, welcome. So happy to have you here. All right. Um, so summing up, 
if if an ideal contains another, that means that the generators the generators divide each other. If they're equal, it means that they are the same up to constant multiplication. And if an ideal is just the, the trivial ideal, the the whole ring, that means that the generator must be a unit in the ring, which is uh, just a constant in the case of a polynomial ring. So now the last thing I want to prove is to actually write down uh, which um, uh, which polynomials generate the maximal ideal. So let's say uh, to make things easier, let's say uh, that we have a polynomial that is not zero. So then the ideal is going to be basically it's prime when f is prime. F is reducible if and only if the ideal it generates is prime and if and only if the ideal generates is maximal. Um, and I should say, since I said f is not zero, I should say that zero is a prime but not maximal ideal. Why is zero a prime ideal? Uh, since k is a field, if you have an element in the in the ring, uh, if something multiplies to be zero, then one of the elements is zero. So right, um, yeah, exactly. Because um, zero, so it's just always true that zero is prime if and only if the ring you're in is an integral domain, which is to say. Because they both mean that two things multiply to zero if and only if one of them is zero, uh, which we've already seen is true for polynomials over a field. And why is it not maximal? Because it's contained in every other ideal. Right. Basically, you name an ideal; it's it's contained in it. Uh, for example, it's contained in X, in the ideal generated by X. And X is not a constant, so it's not the, the unit ideal. <clears throat> okay, so this covers every ideal. Um, right, uh, Mason gets the point. All right, proof. Um, of the proposition. So I have to prove, um, I guess, four implications. So one of them, we, we already know, it's just always true that every maximal ideal is prime. So um, I guess really three implications. Um, so let's say that F is reducible. and G and H are not constants. Um, <clears throat> I want to say, I want to say that the ideal generated by F is not prime. So how can I get there? Wait, so we're um, not in the field. 
Uh, all right, uh, Alex, first, and then Tiago. Um, if you have the ideal generated by F, then that should be equal to the ideal generated by G or H. Uh, because, uh, whoops. I feel like you didn't finish the thought. Um, what were you going to say? Uh, yeah. Me? I'm not sure. Uh, uh, well, so I just, um, that was just a quick question. G and uh -huh. H are not in the field? Right. I mean, they're not constants because um, oh, right. if you're okay, reducible, okay. it means you can't. Um, you, you can decompose it as a product of the polynomials of degree of positive degree. Yeah, got it. Okay. All right. Uh, Alex, uh, I'm not sure about what you said. So you said that F, I'm not sure because of the hearing. Um, you said that F is the product, the ideal <laughs> generated by F is the ideal that G times H generate and then how do we prove that it's not prime based on that? Uh, because every everything generated by F and the ideal generated by F is going to be in the ideal generated by H. So you're saying so that the ideal generated by F is not is contained in the ideal generated by H. Right. Uh, which is which makes it not maximal, right? Uh, right, Alex. Uh, also gets a bonus point. Okay, so this shows that f that so h divides f, so f is containing this ideal, but h is not a multiple of f because he has smaller degree, which means that. This inclusion is strict. They're not, they're actually not equal. Also, H is not a unit. So, uh, F is not maximal. Okay, unfortunately, we still have to show that F is not prime. Um, so, okay. Let's remember um, an ideal. Is prime if a product being in an ideal means that uh, one of the factors has to be in the ideal. So to show that this is not prime, I need to I need to show that this statement is false. Uh, so your prime if for all a and b, this happens. So you have to find a and b for which it doesn't happen in this case. So can you say that the uh, g h is also in the ideal uh, generated by h and the ideal generated by g? So uh, if you have the element gh then you have gh in the ideal generated by f but it's not in uh okay okay so you're saying gh is in the ideal yeah gh is f which is in the ideal f generates however uh g and h are they're both not in the ideal because they cannot be multiples of that. Yeah, that's it. So, okay, we've shown that um, the ideal is not prime and not being prime means you can't be maximal.
Um, right, so this shows that F, F being reducible means that F is now prime, which means that the, the ideal is not maximal. Uh, so now, so that's uh, one side. Now we have to prove the other side. Um, so let's suppose that F is now maximal. So, are there any questions? Okay, uh, so to finish the proof, what we need to prove is that if the ideal is not maximal, then the element is not irreducible. So by definition, what does it mean for the ideal to be not maximal? Sorry, Professor, can you go back just for a little bit? Uh, yeah, I can go back. But you can also remember in, in Moodle, you can you have a link to all these documents. Uh, so you can just, you can go back by yourself. All right, everyone else try to remember the definition of maximal ideal. Ready? Tiago? Yeah, I, right. I forgot to unmute. Oh, okay. Um, no problem. So, what does it mean for an ideal to not be maximal? There's another. There contains another ideal. All right, both is, is answers said the same thing. Um, yeah, if you're maximal, you're the biggest ideal outside of the unit ideal. If you're not maximal, that means there must be something bigger. There exists an ideal. And F is not con is contained properly in I, which is contained properly in, in the polynomial ring. Now, because the polynomial ring is awesome, this ideal uh, must be principal. For some G, um, this ideal is generated by G. So I have that F is properly contained in G, which is properly contained in in the ring. Uh, and now, what's the next step? Remember, this is what I'm trying to get. Could you say F is generated by G? F is generated by G? I don't know. Well, for, I don't know what that means for polynomials. Oh, sorry. What could I say about F and G? Yeah. 
They're co-prime. They're not co-prime. Not, <laughs> yeah. So what did I say, Mason? Uh, G divides F. G divides F, right. This uh, is the last thing we did on Monday, saying that if an ideal contains another, then their generators divide each other. Um, so I guess the opposite of being co-prime. <clears throat> so, okay. Does this mean that F is reducible? Um, probably. Um, I mean, having a divisor doesn't mean you're reducible because, you know, seven has divisors and it's a prime number. You just, it's just that the divisors are one and seven. So is G a constant? And okay, so I should say um, F is G times something else. So I have to make sure that neither H nor G are constants. So could G be a constant based on what's written there? Uh, why? It's, it's true. Uh, it's not equal to the entire ring. Uh, so, and we've already shown that uh, whenever you have uh, an ideal generated by a constant, it gives you the entire. Exactly. So, uh, if it was a constant, um, these ideals, these ideals would be the same. So that's good. Um, so the other problem could be is that F and G have the same degree and then H is a constant. So the answer for this is also no. And why, why is this no? If h was a constant then you would have uh the ideal generated by f is equal to the ideal generated by g exactly um if if h was a constant well i could divide by h um and i would have the inclusion i would have the other inclusion but that inclusion is is not true because i said these ideals are different so f is a model of two polynomials uh, is a product of two polynomials that are not constant and that means that f is reducible and and now we're done so i should show now that f is not prime but that's in the previous page Not last previous. Um, and I believe that proves the proposition. <clears throat> Any questions? All right, so that is the end of chapter 18. 18? No, 17. Uh, not like we're not gonna be talking about polynomials, uh, but 
this chapter was called polynomials. Uh, okay, so chapter 18 um, is about integral domains and factorization. I think it's called integral domains. I, I don't know. Just like polynomial, there's a lot of things you could say about integral domains, and here are uh, some of them. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is about um, fields of fractions. So this is what I'm trying to do. Probably won't finish today. Um, if R is an integral domain, R is contained in a field So um, the idea is we have to construct this field. Um, the way it's called fractal. I hope it's called fractal. No, it's called oh, FD. Oof. Um, so the example, of course, um, is that if I have the if I have the integers uh, thousands of years ago, someone came uh, came up with a way of inventing a field that contains the integers, which is uh, fractions, rational numbers, which is why these are called fields of fractions, of course. Um, and the rationals are a field and they contain the integers. So the question, uh, the question is, can I do this with any integral domain? Can I do this with a polynomial ring? You, Probably you're probably aware that you you can um, that it does work. Um, I don't know. I feel like every example uh, you would believe that it works. Um, but the thing is, I, we can we can just do this every time abstractly, canonically, and then never worry about about it anymore. And we can talk about the fields of fractions um of, of any integral domain so um so we are trying to construct q from z so of course you have to pretend like you don't know yet what the rational numbers are and and see how we construct them if we only have the integers so, so yeah. Is it is it called fields of fractions just because of the rational numbers, or are every is every field sort of like a quote unquote fraction? Yeah, I mean, you know, we would also call this a fraction, right? Even if it's not over the integers. Okay. I mean, I guess fraction fraction means the same as division or quotient, also called field of quotients. But I think I hear fields of fractions a lot more. Field of quotients. Um, okay, so we also only have the integers. Um, so what is a What is a fraction? Um, as a set, how could you describe um, the fractions? Uh, so, a, yeah. A is in the integers and B is in the integers, excluding zero. Yeah, all right, uh, very good points. So 
I'm, I'm talking about uh, the rationals, not because I, I think you don't know what fractions over the rationals are, but because whatever we do for the integers is going to work for every ring. So um, a over, over b is a pair of integers. Um, such that b is not zero. So really, um, I mean, we write it, uh, we, if you write things as a, as a quotient, then you're tempted to do algebra with it, but I don't know how to do algebra with fractions yet because I'm only, I'm only now constructing the rationals. So, um, so far, I'm only trying to figure out what the set of rationals is. Not, I don't even know how to add them, how to multiply them. So, in order to not be tempted to like to do operations that I would like to do with fractions, I'm going to just um, write them as a pair. So the set of pairs of an integer and an integer that is not zero is is a product of, of sets, right? The product of two sets is a set of pairs. Okay. Um, so is this is this Q as a set? So is Q just pairs of numbers? Uh, no. Why not? Uh, the things in Q aren't, uh, well, like you can reduce uh, an A and a B. Uh, like uh, two and four, you know, that's. Right. Um, right between. Was that sensor? Like you can always, there's always a number in between two other numbers in Q. Okay, but I'm not talking about what between means. And I'm not, I don't wanna get into that because I want to, my goal is to do this for a ring. And rings, you can add and multiply, but they don't come with any notion of between or ordering, you know? Um, so, you know, I know Q, you know, Q lives is part of the real numbers, which has a lot more, the real numbers don't just have sum and multiplication, they have a distance, they have shape, uh, they have limits, you know, but rings don't have any of those. So just from the point of view of what the RSS said and the operations, the, the big points here is that uh, fractions can be reduced. Um, one half is equal to two fourths, like Mason said, um, but these are not the same pairs of integers. So um, we need to define, so Q is a set of equivalence classes. Uh, of of these pairs of elements. So Basically, in this set of, of pairs of integers, some things are some things are equal as fractions when they're not literally equal. Just like some integers are equal mod three, even though they're not literally equal. So we need to define an equivalence relation uh, on <clears throat> on Q. So Q is Z the quotient by an equivalence relation uh, 
the relation that says when two elements are equal as fractions. So um, when are two fractions equal? Um, of course, you know, same people write this uh, in this way. So when is AB equal to CD? Yeah, right. When AD equals BC. Right. And notice, so, <clears throat> I mean, I don't know about you, I guess it's a matter of preference, but I don't think of this, if I see, you know, one half equals two fourths, what I think is that they're both 50% of the cake or whatever, but that doesn't make sense. That's not an algebraic thing. It's that, uh, you know, real numbers are intuitive. But what Roy just said, AD equals BC is a definition that only involves um, multiplication, which is something that any ring has any quality. So this is this this actually is going to work if I just if I want to do this over any ring. So okay, let's do this. Let R be in integral domain. <clears throat> um, then, so, then the relation um, on R, the pairs, of uh, an element of R and then non-zero element is an equivalence relation. So this is a proposition. And the, I guess, I should say the set of fractions. Um, but of course it will be a field, uh, but I'm not saying how you add or multiply. of R is uh, the set of classes for this equivalence relation. And in the book, they call it FR, so F for fractions. Um, I've seen I've seen a lot more often, I've seen frac um, for just for fractions. But maybe I'll, I'll try to stick with the book's notation. Okay, so I have to prove that uh, this relation is an equivalence relation. So now, of course, you know this for the, you know this for uh, the rationals, but now we're doing it for an arbitrary ring. Hopefully it works the same. Uh, so I should start by remembering what an equivalence relation is. So an equivalence relation uh, needs to have three properties. One is that everything is related. Equivalence relation means you have the properties that equality has. Um, so everything, is in the same class as itself. If A equals B, then B equals A. And if you have two things, three things that are related, uh, then the first is related to the last. And and then once you have an equivalence relation, it makes sense to take the quotient by that um, to get uh, to get a, a set. On a set. We can on the set X um, uh, 
we can take the the quotient and an element of the quotient is not an element of x but it's a, a set of a lot of elements that are related to each other uh, so for example on on z we have if they're congruent we have the two elements are related we can define this relation congruent mod two and then z mod this relation is the integers mod two which is made of two sets the set of the even numbers and the set of the odd numbers okay um i mean i hope this is a review all right, so I have to prove this about uh, the relation of fractions being equal. So, um, is a fraction equal to itself? Um, well, yes, it is because the relation means you cross multiply. So this is this is clear. Um, Is the relation symmetric? Well, this means that AD is BC, and this means that CB is DA, and this is obviously true. Uh, the rings are commutative. Fun fact: you, uh, some fraction, some non-commutative rings have fraction fields, but. Oof. That's that's like a huge mess. Um, right? Any questions? This is um, oh. <clears throat> okay. So the last the last thing is a transitive property. That's where you, we actually have to do something. Okay. So. A B related to C D uh, what does this mean? Um, it means that A D is B C C D related to E F means that C F is E D. So somehow from these two equations. I have to conclude that AF is BE. Oh, I have one minute. I don't have time to ask you how to do this. Um, all right, well, I'm gonna spoil the fun for you, but uh, if you multiply this by F, you will get ADF equals BCF. <clears throat> but now, using this equation, CF is BDE. So AFD is BED. So does this imply that AF is BE? Which would mean that AB is EF as desired. Why can I cancel the D? Since it's all equivalence, is there fractions? And it's also non zero. Okay, D is not zero, right? Is that enough to know that we can't, we can cancel the D? Because these are not numbers, these are elements of a ring. Why can we cancel? When when can we cancel something uh, from a multiplication? Well, I mean, I can write it like this. Uh, this equals to zero. So why does this mean that AF minus BE is zero? 
since it's an integral domain since it's an integral domain all right yeah uh, all right tensor gets a bonus points so this just doesn't work at all if it's not an integral domain the, the whole fraction field thing you can work around this but this just this construction doesn't work um okay so with because it's integral domain we can cancel the d from there and and we're good to go we have an equivalent relation we can take the quotient and and the quotients as you as you know will will be like fractions on one friday i'll tell you how to add and multiply them but i mean you already know how to add and multiply them all right um and that's it uh recording has stopped uh